John Bruno, who was who was who had come down with uh, Richard Edlin when Boss was formed, had somehow met Cameron. They became friends after Aliens, and so um, Boss Film was going to do uh, the the Abyss, and John was going to be the supervisor. It was going to be done at Boss, and unfortunately, something happened and it didn't happen there. And um, talked to Jim, and he said, unfortunately, there was a meltdown with Boss. Whatever, it's a long story. We'll go into it, but they were going to sort of do a lot of the photog underwater miniature photography themselves as a, as a unit under the production in South Carolina at this, this site that they had found. And DreamQuest had gotten the, um, another uh, piece of it, you know, all the motion control sort of miniature shots and what have you. And so it was going to be sort of farmed out. That was the first time they sort of pieced out um, work on a film, I believe. I don't think they had done that much. Usually it would go to one company. And so the, the miniatures had been uh, awarded to um, Rick Price Wonderworks, and um, and they had to do it. They had to do a very tight budget. So I think that Brick had come in lower than everyone else, so he got the job. Anyway, my job was going to be to go to to South Carolina, and and really maintain the models. I didn't have to build anything, so I thought oh, this is going to be a great job. We're going to shoot in the water. I was a diver. So I was sort of overseeing the, the models as they as they were um, coming out there and, and Wonderworks. I think because they'd sort of bid low to get the job, it was getting difficult for them to finish everything. So um, and it was I think just to get the show going, they just sort of had to do it. And so I ended up building more stuff there than I had anticipated. And I called my I was having trouble getting people to go out there because word was it was a really hard show, and we weren't paying a lot, and I needed somebody to weld up frameworks to make an underwater terrain for the deep core to slide on, you know, when it slides to a halt. And I called my brother, who was a welder, and I said, hey, do you want to come work on a movie? So he came out, you know, so we could, I could abuse him because he didn't know how, <laughs> he didn't know the thing yet. But he had a good time on it, and, uh, and I needed uh, someone to sit with the models because I was running the shop. It was a small shop, but I, was, I couldn't be with them all the time. So Adam Gelbart and I had gone diving, and I called Adam and said, "Hey, you know, come out. It's going to be great. <laughs> you could dive and you know have a lot of fun." And uh, and and so he came out, and he they shot the miniatures at at night because of uh, just the light filtering through the water it was easier to shoot. So Adam had a great time. So whatever would break the next day, I get a list from Adam, and we would fix it because they they'd pull the deep core. It was an, it was actually a nice model? It was it, it would it was probably 12 by 12 feet, it was huge. And they would pull it out on, on a crane and put it on these, these big sort of steel sawhorses to so let the water drain out of it. And, and I get some of the guys, we go fix whatever got broken the, the night before. Because, uh, you know, water is really hard on things, you, you know, and it's not, it's, and when you're picking a big model like this up and swinging it around, stuff gets broken. So it was a, it was a very demanding show. The Abyss, which is James Cameron's underwater sort of epic and I got to build a couple of models for that and what was really interesting was here I am a junior model maker I've never really had the experience building models but they handed me a, a set of specifications and me and one other model maker uh, Jim McGeechy who uh, was sort of a veteran at this uh, were given the task to build this model no drawings um, just dimensions and what it was which was the inside of a uh, a submarine's uh, engine room. And based on that, I did some sketches. Uh, Jim and I sort of parted the uh, model into who was going to do what. He was going to do half, I was going to do the other half. He'd do the floor, i do the ceiling, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we built this model from the ground up. I think the one that I ended up working the most on, and, and I actually can point out parts of things I did very specifically in the film, was The Abyss. Um, and The Abyss was fun. I ended up becoming one of uh, two or three people on that film who made all of the scale model puppets of the actors, which was really fun, actually. Um, we made them out of, you know, latex, foam latex. They were cast, the little bodies, and then we detailed them with lots of different things. And we made a number of different scales. We ended up doing a third scale of Ed Harris for the scene when he's dropped over the edge of the abyss. And, of course, that was sort of heartbreaking because we spent weeks building this magnificent model of him, and then they just threw it off the edge of the three-story building and filmed it. 
which was fine. That was what it was intended for, and it worked out great. But it was still kind of heartbreaking to watch it hit the asphalt and shatter into a million pieces. So. We did quite a bit of work, you know, all the underwater stuff, the crane crash, the, the large sub that Wonderworks had built. I think it was like 30 feet long when it crashes. And we, we shot that in the big tank, in the, in the crane, the crane uh, falling through the water was shot in the big tank because we needed to get a long run of water. And this was 60 feet deep at its deepest. We built a Benthic Explorer. We built the Montana Submarine. Uh, Dave Beasley souped the Montana sub, and and we built. It was basically, you know, an aluminum tube with a bunch of bulkheads that would get larger. That we then stuffed with, or um, wrapped actually with Clark foam. Uh, Clark foam's like surfboard foam, but it was. I had never done anything like that before. It was amazing, and Dave Beasley engineered all of that. Um, kind of planned that out. The, the Montana was like 40 feet long. We actually had an aircraft company spin these thin aluminum nose cones for it. So when it got down to Gaffney, they could crash it into the, the um, miniature rocks that they had set up there. I, I think the biggest problem with it was because they were doing this stuff in real water, you know, you, things had a tendency to float if there were air pockets in them. And there was a, the deep core oil rig. At Wonderworks, we built the 14th scale version of that. And uh, Eric Carrollstead was the lead on that model. Alpha Shea was kind of like a co-lead with him on that. Ken Swenson was the overall miniature soup. And then, you know, Brick would kind of ride in on his Harley and walk over, hey guys, what are you guys working on? You know, kind of thing. He was, a, he was quite a character. So there was a smaller version that was used for all the stunt work and they'd shoot that high speed in Gaffney. Um, I think Al and a couple of other guys went down to South Carolina with it to kind of man things. Um, and, uh, you know, we just detailed the daylights out of it. That was, that was the first thing I'd ever worked on that was just that big and, and you know, we're, it was going to have to be used for multiple takes um, and have to just survive getting the the daylights just knocked out of it and dragged around on the, you know, for the ocean floor sequences. And we did um, the crane ca crash sequence, the Skotak brothers did that, and, and because I, I just did the model stuff for them because it was, we all knew each other. And uh, the Skos did a number of shots for Jim on that. The crane crash sequence, um, we were was originally approached to supervise the film, but uh, what had happened after Aliens, I had uh, gotten ill for a period of time and um, I was just kind of recovering and um, didn't think it was wise to get into something like The Abyss at the time. We had you know, worked on Aliens and had worked with Jim before, so I turned it down. Now, maybe a year later, uh, we get approached by Jim and Julia Gibson, who was also on that film. Uh, about uh, coming in and doing some shots that sort of had the feeling that nobody else wanted to do. <laughs> they they were involved heavily involved with miniatures and were involved with water, and um, you know pretty tricky involving perspective angles. And um, so we were hired directly by Fox. This was pre uh, forward productions, uh, and we went to a facility called Harbor Star, which is a very large hangar uh, structure. The NTIs were being photographed through a big uh, plex uh, sheet on the side that was um, a view viewing window on the side of the tank. Uh, so the Benthic Explorer, um, what we what we wound up doing is constructing part of the Benthic Explorer on the on the top of this tank. Um, the miniatures had already been built. The Benthic had already been built uh, by Brick Price, I, I, I believe. Uh, so what we had to do was strip all those pieces off and make our own deck, separate deck, but take all the detailed pieces and reconstruct that whole uh, area of the Benthic Explorer or sort of remake it uh, again on top of this big tank. Uh, the, and then the uh, crane itself was partially you know, plastic and steel structure with a lot of lead pieces for the girder work to crumple, that sort of thing. So. 
we uh, assembled our, a crew of a lot of our, our guys who worked later worked with us at Forward, but guys who had worked with us at uh, New World, as well as some people who were involved with the Abyss, and uh, worked in Harbor Star and built the miniatures there and shot them right there. Uh, the the really torturous aspect of the Abyss is that crane crash. Uh, we had figured on doing three takes of it. Uh, as of a Tuesday on a particular week, we were planning on shooting the first take on a Thursday or a Friday, reconstructing it for a second take on the Saturday, and then another take on the following Monday. Well, on this particular Tuesday, I got a call from Jim Cameron. He said he needed to be on our set using our tank as of late Thursday, the very day that we were going to shoot, well, that we were aiming, hopefully, to shoot the very first take. So now we had only one shot at this thing. It had to work. No ifs, ands, or buts had to work. Now, to get the angles, there were four different angles. So we had to have four cameras running with water splashing, dump tanks going. We had churners to churn up the water. We had these buoys that were in the well in the ship that had to sway along with the swaying of the deck of the ship. So those were on wires. Those had to be operated. We had the actual release and the tug and the pulling in of the of the uh, crane into the water, which was rigged by Bob Spurlock. Um, and uh, we also had created a 40 or 40 or 50 foot wide wave horizon uh, against a big rear rear screen. We had a, a big translucent screen we had set up with straddling across the back of the tank. So that had to be time. So I made a chart on it and did all this on counts. You know, the, the deck goes this way and this way and this way. The buoys are timed on the count of three. They go this way, four, five. On the count of six, they go back the other way. Same with the guys operating the wave in, in the back. But also we had the cameras tilting as well. We had four cameras that had to be in sync tilting, and this is at 120 frames a second. So once we started the whole thing rolling with all these cameras and the rain and everything coming down, the cameras were also in sync, going one, two, <laughs> you know, pitching this way and that way, you know, at least in fairly close proximity. So we rehearsed this and we had issues with water spraying into the lens, so we had spinners on the camera and we used Rain-X to sort of disperse the, the uh, raindrops. But also, one of the things that was a concern of ours, and it was nothing we could do anything about really, because the, the, the scale was predetermined. We were given 10th scale. I would have preferred to have done it more in, say, 6th scale, at, uh, sort of at a minimum. Uh, quarter scale would have been great, but it just wasn't there. But when the water hit, uh, the deck from the dump tanks it would tend to, the surface tension would create a roundness on the edges, a puddling effect, which we didn't like. So uh, came up with the idea of uh, using photo flow, mixture of photo flow and rubbing alcohol to coat the deck, which has a way of breaking the water tension and flattening it. So right before we went, we'd spilled buckets of this mixture. And we were doing this in all the miniatures that we shot to flatten the water. This was some, a little trick that we had learned on another, on another film. So we'd have to coat the deck, and as soon as that deck was coated, we knew that it would flow off, so we had to start shooting right away. And uh, So it was all done on account. Um, one take only, and that, I think, was probably one of the toughest moments I've ever had, to because I was calling the shots. I'd call, okay, roll camera, and <laughs> cueing it. So we shot the thing, and this is pre-digital days, so the film had to go to the lab. Now, to get this set done, because it was really not scheduled to be finished that fast, we had been working almost 48 hours straight. So we shot this thing. I won't even go into the detail that we actually have to do a second shot with that, with that crane. It had to be fished up from the bottom of the tank, brought back up and dropped again for another piece of film that was not used, as it turned out. We had no idea how it turned out. Had no idea. This is a make it or break it. He could, it'd be an utter disaster. Film could have been fogged, there could have, camera could have, you know, all kinds of things might be wrong, might look terrible. Pick up the phone, it's Julia Gibson. All I hear is, Jim fucking loves you! <laughs> Jim fucking loves you, it's great! Thank God she got it over with that quick, <laughs> quickly. 
I mean, talk about relieved because I, you know, he was very happy with the footage. But to not be there when it was being shown, not to know exactly what we got, I felt we had got it from from what we could tell. But again, at 120 frames with water splashing all over and whether water hit the lenses, obscured, but four cameras, all four cameras worked fine. We got we got it on every, and, and just a horrendous, you never want to go through that again. And, you know, but those moments came again on Terminator 2 when we had to blow up the city. There were moments when this either works or we have to rebuild the entire city again. And we did. But then we had multiple takes. <laughs> So after after WonderWorks, their their work was done. I worked on the Benthic Explorer model and the breakaway crane base. When the when the cable pulls and snaps and the crane falls, the the base for that kind of crumbles, and I I did the lead work on that for those beams, basically wrapped lead, you know, thin sheet lead around uh, a plexiglass shape, and then pulled the plex pieces out. I worked with. Niels Nielsen on some of that stuff. That was over at WonderWorks too, but when the WonderWorks job ended, Design Setters was doing the miniature work for DreamQuest. DreamQuest was shooting all of the dry for wet stuff, Hoyt Yateman's place. And so I went to Design Setters and worked with Dave Goldberg and Mike Stewart and Henry Darnell. That's where I met Mike Possert who I worked with a bunch of times after that. Mike Stewart and Mike Possert were, and Henry were working on the, the motion control versions of the uh, little underwater one-man one vehicle. The Benthic Explorer, which was an amazing model, which was 45 feet long and I think 15 feet wide, was shot at a place called Westport, Washington. And I, I initially didn't go out for that shoot, but I got a call from Laura Buff. You have to come out and help because they were having some difficulties. So it was a... It's supposed to be a hurricane, so they, so Bruno and, and Laura Buff found, I think they just looked on a map and found an area that was a wide uh, opening. I think it was a, it might have led to a river, that area, but it was a bay. And so you could sort of get back in the bay and then look out, look west, and see just the ocean. But you were close to land, and, and they, they wanted a place so they could stage, you know, this big shoot. So it was shot in November. Uh, they needed bad weather because again, it's a hurricane, and so it's um, not not many people had shot on the water. I hadn't, and it was extremely difficult towing this thing, and it would break its tow lines. And my brother, having been in the Navy, said that happens all the time with ships. They always there's a little surge, and then the tow line snaps. And one day I wasn't there, but this the Bethy Explorer, uh, it was bad weather. The tow line snapped. It started heading out to sea. <laughs> And they somehow captured it. Even the Coast Guard guys turned away. They couldn't sort of, the, the weather was so bad, they couldn't sort of get it. And somehow one of the WonderWorks guys jumped in the water and climbed aboard and tied this thing up and they brought it back. And, and when we used the, the, one of the destroyers I eventually rented from Paramount that I had seen at, at Pinewood, we sort of refitted it to make it look like more of a modern destroyer. It was actually a World War II destroyer, but we sort of raked the, the stacks over and, and reworked it. And it was a 30 foot long model. And I had put in um, a bilge pump, just a pump system in case it's sort of taken on water with it. these big, they're called deep cycle marine batteries to power this thing. We sprayed it with foam because I'm afraid if the thing sunk out there, we'd be sort of we'd be sunk. So I took that out and got some great footage because it was actually taking on water, I found out later. The, um, the stern had gone underwater and because it was now heavy, the waves were crashing over the bow. It looked great. It was It was for a big rear projection shot that ultimately was shot but not used in the movie. And uh, I don't think you see that. You see it at the very end when the, when the uh, NTI ship comes up and you see the destroyer sort of repositioning itself. And um, uh, all that end stuff was done by uh, Fantasy II. Gene Warren did all that stuff and, uh, and I thought it looked pretty good. You know, the, the, the big pieces coming out of water. That was built sort of through Dream Quest um, at a place called, I think it was called Design Setters. There were so many different model, you know, uh, model companies doing stuff for Dream Quest, and and it just got sort of spread all over the place. The ocean, where you can find places to shoot with the, that no horizon, where you're trying to be way out somewhere, but you have tides, 
you got you can't you can't put anything in the water or went what height is it's constantly changing on you plus the surf's up it's down it's sideways it's this so if you're trying to do something that's going to take some time it's just forget it you're just not going to do anything in the ocean like that uh, on any kind of budget salt and sea has a tide of about you know half an inch because it's only 40 miles long and so it, it, the so you can go out in the water, pick a depth, put all kinds of stuff there. So in the, in the abyss where all those things come up out of the water and all that, that's all rigged from underwater. I went out about 300 feet, and since it's so gradual, it means it's almost level any spot you pick. It was only 11 feet deep, 300 feet out, and that's where we, we shot. And then towards Mexico, it always looked like you were out in the middle of the ocean. Now it's true. The pollution there has gotten worse and worse and worse, so the water gets kind of brownish. Uh, and then it was better during the French Atlantic in the late 70s. The um, abyss was late 80s, and it had gotten worse. So I had to get cases of Mrs. Stewart's bluing, and whenever we would shoot with the spires coming out from get those shots going, all the foreground water was, we had all... He filled up all these sink containers and then squirted the hell out of this Mrs. Stewart's bluing, and it made the water go um, Caribbean blue. Uh, and the Dreamquest did some beautiful stuff as well. You know, they, they uh, Hoyt had come up with a an overhead um, motion control system that was steel I beams above them, and a big traveler that that would uh, when when they're actually um, exploring the wreck. And their little mini subs, what they they built the the wreck of the of the model, and it was shot dry, dry for wet, where they pump smoke into the stage to make it look like water. And what they did is overhead they had a uh, a traveler to move the mini mini sub that that was powered and actually had a rear projection thing in it. So when you'd see Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio going like this, she was being rear projected into the glass. It was a double layered glass sphere filled with with um, oil to, to give you that that lensing effect that happens on the real one and you couldn't see the wires so that was all done in, in multiple passes you know they do they do the good lighting pass with the smoke and then they turn the smoke off and they do the rear screen pass and then do a little light pass painstaking way to do it but it still it looks really good and so that's that was you know dream quest did a lot of shots on that and it was an incredibly complicated um, movie to put together.